Hello, Axe Church. Frog is checking in from sunny San Diego. We're so excited to worship with you guys today. We love y'all. We miss you so much. Good morning, guys. This is Rosie. I'm just glad y'all are here today to worship with us. And we miss you guys a whole lot. And we just want to say a shout out to Sunshine. Happy birthday, Sunshine. Good morning, Axe Church. I'm excited to be worshiping with you guys in spirit and hearing the word preached by Pastor Booker today. And until we can meet again in person, be blessed. Hey everybody, it's the Tolls. We're glad you joined us today. Hope you enjoy the service. We miss, miss you guys. guys. Well, good morning, Axe Church. Thank you for joining us this morning to worship Jesus. We'd like to invite you to invite family and friends to jump online and hang out with us. For those of you that are our local family, we would love for you to swing by today at 1 o'clock Come swing by the church for our drive through picnic. Lunch is on us. We've got hamburgers and chips. Bring the kids. We've got goodies for them. Come drive through. Wave hello. We would love to see you. Now let's have some praise and worship. Good morning, Axe. We are so excited to be here to worship with you this morning. I want for you, wherever you're at, to stand to your feet. I want for you to begin to welcome the presence of God into your homes right now. He is so eager to meet with us this morning. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to come. We invite you to move in our hearts. Lord, we need your presence. Father, we invite you to release joy this morning, to release your hope this morning, to come and do what only you can do in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship King Jesus together. We've seen what you can do, oh God of wonder, your power has no end. Oh, the things you've done before in greater measure, oh, you will do again. Come on, because there's no prison wall you can't break through no mountain you can't move all things are possible and there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible the darkest night you you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, and you've already won, oh God of revival. Oh, you rose in victory, and now you're seated forever on the throne. Hey. Oh, so I should my heart feel what you defeated. I will trust in you alone, cause there's no you can't break through no mountain you can't move all things are possible hey. and there's no broken body you can't raise no soul that you can't save all things are possible the darkest night you can lie Come awaken your people. 
come awake in this city oh god of revival pour it out pour it out every stronghold will crawl hear the chains hit the ground oh god of revival pour it out pour it out come awake in your people Come awake in this city Oh God of revival Pour it out, pour it out oh, Every stronghold will crumble Hear the chains hit the ground Oh, oh God of revival Pour it out, pour it out The darkest night you can light it up, you can light it up, oh God of a revival, let hope arise, death is overcome, cause you've already won, oh God of a revival, sing it again, oh you can light
the troubles. You breathe life to the troubles. You breathe life to the troubles. Awaken an army. You breathe life to the troubles. You breathe life to the troubles. You breathe life to the troubles. Awaken an army. To the troubles, oh, breathe life to the troubles, breathe life to the troubles, oh, awaken an army, breathe life to the troubles, oh, breathe life to the troubles, breathe life to the troubles. This is 
you are surrounded this morning that he goes before you beside you and behind you and we want you to know X church that we are going to battle for you in worship and in prayer that we are with you we are worshiping beside you this morning and we are asking for the Lord to move on every one of your behalf and we bless you this morning in Jesus name in Jesus name you're going to see on the screen three ways that you can give this morning. I'm going to pray over the offering, and then we're going to hear a wonderful message from Booker this morning. So, Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you, Lord, that it's in our sacrifice, Father, that you bless it, and you return more than we could ever give you, Lord. Father, thank you for who you are, that you are a generous God, and we're called to be a generous people. And Lord, we just declare this morning that through our praise and through our worship, through our offering to you, Lord, that this is the way that we fight our battle. Lord, that our weapons are not the weapons of the world, but we fight with spiritual weapons that are strong and mighty. And if you are for us, Lord, then nothing can be against us. So, Lord, we give to you this morning. We ask that you bless it in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Good morning, guys. We are so thankful that you have joined us today to worship with us and to dig into God's Word with us. And just want to thank you for joining us, and just be sure and invite your, your friends and family to join us as well. It's a great time and opportunity to, to get people to church that may not would come normally, but they can experience church uh, in their living rooms or, or in the workplace. And so just want to thank you guys again for joining us. want to really just thank our worship and media team for doing a great job of just pulling this together. And man, just heard so many great comments of, um, from, from so many of you guys that just thankful for the job they're doing. And then lastly, before we get into the message, I just want to remind you again that today from 1 to 2, we're having a drive-by picnic here at the church, which means you just get to roll up in your car. Um, we are going to uh, give you a burger and, uh, and some chips and a drink and really just want to see your face. We just want to say hi to you guys, get to pray over you real quickly, but you're not even going to have to get out of your car. We'll, we'll maintain some, some safe social distancing guidelines, and, uh, but we just really want to see you, just want to bless you today. So I hope to see you today between one and two. All right, before we get into the Word of God, let's, let's pray. And just uh, join me in prayer, just uh, wherever you're at, just join me in prayer that, that God would just minister and speak to us and bring freedom today. Lord God, we, uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that you saw, uh, from the beginning of time, you saw ahead that we would need your word so bad. God, and your word is good, it is powerful, it reveals you, Jesus, to us. It reveals you, Father, it reveals you, Holy Spirit. And we are thankful for you. We love you. And we ask today that we would just begin to get revelation, an understanding of this topic that we're going to discuss, that we begin to just get some real truth inside of us about it. Lord, we bless you. We love you and we need you. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Matthew. Uh, We're going to start in Matthew chapter 19. So really, I was looking back earlier, we started a study of the Gospel of Matthew right at a year ago, so last April, April 2019, we started going through Matthew, and we've taken some breaks along the way, but I want us to start getting back into it now. So Matthew chapter 19, uh, verses 3 through 10, this is where we're at, and I'm going to read through this uh, story here, and then we're going to begin to dig into to, to a piece of this story. So Matthew 19, 3, if you have your Bibles, open them up. Here we go. It says, Some Pharisees came to Jesus testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Verse seven, and they said to him, Why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and send her away? And he said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. So there was obviously something at the beginning that wasn't meant to be like this. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. Now, I know as I'm reading that, you're probably just going, uh-oh, what are we talking about today? Because obviously, one of the topics here is the issue of divorce, and these Pharisees are trying to trick Jesus, and the disciples got some questions, and they're asking Jesus, basically, when is it okay to get divorced? But I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about kind of an underlying story, theme, or, or something that's going on in the hearts of those that Jesus are talking to. And so really, we can grab a hold of this um, Let's just read verses um, verse 9 and 10. So I want, to, I want to read this. It's really interesting here. Now remember, this is the disciples who, who, who ask him this question in verse 10, or make this statement. Verse 9, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. And the disciples said to him, If the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. And so Jesus basically tells them there's not a, there's not a good reason and we're not going to get into exactly what he's referring to in immorality here, but basically he's saying there's not a good reason to get a divorce. Basically, divorce happens because of the hardness of your heart. And the disciples' response is this. They say, and they say if, if, Jesus, this is the case, it's better that no one gets married. So what are they saying here? What they're saying is basically this. If a man can't choose to divorce his wife whenever he wants, 
for any reason, it would be better not to marry. And so right here in this comment from the disciples, we begin to get a picture of the culture 2,000 years ago when it came to the male-female relationship. We, we know that historically and from the Bible that women were treated as property at this time. And even in the disciples' statement, you see this. Like, man, if we can't just divorce our wives for any reason, it would be better not to marry. Like, they can't comprehend that there's not a good reason. And so I hope you get what I'm saying. You know, they, they, they had a lens that they were looking through, and everything that Jesus spoke to them was, was filtered through this cultural lens uh, that they were living in. So everything Jesus said about women was filtered um, through the disciples' lens of, of, of a culture that said women were property. And today, we still have these lenses, right? We, maybe we don't view women as, as property, but no matter the topic, guys, we have lenses. We all have lenses that maybe we've just grown up in a, in a culture, in a church culture, or in a family that, that kind of gives us a lens that we view certain topics a certain way. And when we have that lens, that becomes like, it, it makes sometimes truth hard to penetrate it. Because we, we think that truth is one thing when maybe it's another. And so what I want to talk about today is, is not only what we see here in the male-female relationship uh, in the Scripture, but I really want us to get into this, to this um, topic of the role of women in the church. I personally think this is a really big deal that, that we understand this correctly, that we know what the Bible says about this, because over half the church is women. And so if we don't have a correct view of the role of women in the church, then half the church will be affected by that, if not the whole church, really. And so I just want to challenge you. The lens that the disciples are looking through as they interpret what Jesus is saying, I'm going to ask that as we begin to study this today, that, that we would try to ask the Lord to just wipe away and wash away some of those lenses that we can get a clear, real, true understanding of what God's Word says about this. Um, so we're going to be talking about the role of women in the church, and I really got some thoughts here I want to make sure that I, that I share with you. This is a difficult and controversial topic that requires a deep examining of Scripture. It really does. It requires like going in deep from the beginning to the end. What is the Lord saying here? Um, we are going to take our time on this, at least, a, at least probably three weeks. We really need to take our time on this to really uh, get into all the verses that we need to get into. Um, obviously, there are two main beliefs, maybe some variances in here, but there are two main beliefs when it comes to the role of women in the church. One is that women, one belief is that women um, cannot be in leadership. They can't preach, they can't teach, and Scripture is used to justify this belief. The other view, of course, is that women can lead, that women can preach and teach. And uh, the same thing, Scripture is used to justify this belief. And, and I, I want to say a few things as we get into this. I, you know, we've got to be able to love others that believe differently than we do. Man, there are some people I know that love Jesus, that are great people and have a different, or love Jesus and love people. They're great people, and, but they have a different view than I do of this topic. Um, but I want to look at Scripture, and I want to tackle some of the difficult verses that we find in regards to this issue. So I've got a few things up front I want to share with you. First of all, I believe that there are differences between men and women. I mean, everybody gets that right. There are differences between men and women. And some people, I want to say that because we'll come back to it, some people are better suited to, to lead in certain ways in certain places than other people are. But is it an issue of male-female, or is it an issue of certain people are better equipped and, and better wired to lead in certain ways? Um, I believe that Scripture teaches that in the home, and I'm, I'm, in the home, we've got to throw that piece in there. I believe that Scripture teaches that in the home, the husband is the head of the wife. And, and in this sense, he is to provide loving leadership to her. That, that is the husband's role. We're going to look at Scripture about that today. The husband is to provide loving leadership to his wife, but he's not, he was never meant to dominate or have dominion over her or to rule her. <coughs> Excuse me. I also believe this, and I'm just going to lay out some of my beliefs at the beginning so you know where we're heading. I believe that in the church, women can serve in any role that a man can. I don't believe that Scripture teaches otherwise, and I know you're, you're probably starting to think of some verses in your mind. We are going to get to those. I believe that, that women can serve in any role in a church that a man can. 
There are many people that do not believe like I believe, and I don't think that necessarily makes them chauvinistic. I don't think that necessarily makes them, um, it doesn't make them bad or anything. Again, I know people that, that do believe that women cannot serve in leadership roles in the church. They can't preach and teach, but they're great people who love Jesus. And, uh, man, I'm okay with us having a disagreement on this topic. Um, so, I want to get into it today. We're going to go back and we're going to start at the beginning. And, and I hope, so again, I think the reason this is so, there's so many reasons, but one of the reasons this is so important is, is over half of the church is, are women. And if, and if the Bible does permit women to lead, teach, preach, and we um, don't allow that, well then that is, that is a big negative impact on the church. I mean, we, we've, we've got we've to follow what the Scripture says and, and realize that, that there's something that God wants to do in women. So, I want you to turn your Bibles through to Genesis chapter 1. And here's why we're going to start here. If you were to read most books or, 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 or hear sermons on this, hear sermons that say women cannot lead in the church, that women cannot be in a place of authority that women cannot preach and teach, they always start with Genesis 1 as, as the proof or as the foundation to say that women can't. So I want us to start there as well so that we can look at really what it's saying. <coughs> Excuse me. So Genesis 1, 26. Here we go. Then God said, Let us, now this is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, Let us make man in our image. Now, we'll see in just a minute, this reference to man in Genesis 1 is mankind. It's not talking about the male gender. It is a reference to mankind. Let us make man or mankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And God created man or mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule, some versions say have dominion, and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, we see, when I said it, when it says man here at the beginning, that it's talking about mankind, he actually says it later, right? <clears throat> he says that we, God made man, he made mankind male and female, he created them, and he gave them dominion, he called them to rule over the earth. But I want you to notice here the focus of Genesis 1 is, is not differentiating or not saying that one, I mean, obviously they're different because he created male and female, and both are needed, but there is nothing here about one sex ruling over the other. In fact, it, it appears to be that what is spoken here is it's a focus on the equality of, man, on the equality of, of men and women, of the male and female genders, because he says here God created both of them in his image, and he told them to rule and have dominion over the earth, but he doesn't say anything hear about them ruling over one another. So there's no way to, take, to, to, to pull anything out of this that says that um, men should rule or have dominion over, over women. There's nothing that, that says that here. So men and women were created equally in the beginning in the garden in the image of God, fully equal in value and honor with each other. So you were going back to the beginning. And in the beginning, think about that, God created male and female equally. He created them equally to, 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 to blend together, to become one, to rule and reign together. They were both equally given free will, and we're going to really talk about free will today. They were both given authority over their own lives. They weren't given authority to rule over each other. It doesn't say that anywhere. Infringing on, on, on the other's free will. And so really the ultimate issue that we begin to deal with when we talk about um, this issue, it's one of authority. Who has authority and when do they have authority? And is it, is it this person or that person? Is it male or female? Who has authority? So this is the ultimate issue that we're dealing with. And so do women have authority in the church, can they have authority in the church? So just remember, God is the source of all authority, and he delegates it into certain areas of life as he chooses. And there are six uh, basic institutions of authority in our lives. 
And so I hope it, this seems like a lot of information, you know, just pause it, rewind it, whatever, but let's really begin to understand, understand this. Six basic institutions of authority in our life. The first one is free will, and I would say this is the most important. This is the authority that each person has over their own life or their own choices. So it's the authority you have over your own life. The second one is marriage, and this is the authority that is, that is framed within the the confines of marriage, within marriage, that, that uh, with a husband and wife, we're going to talk about that. Uh, the second institution of authority is family, and obviously kids submitting to their parents. The fourth uh, institution of authority is, go- is the government, and obviously there's, there's authority there. Uh, the fifth is, and these aren't really in particular order, the fifth is the workplace, and the sixth that we're going to talk about is the church. So the, if the issue is authority, and we have these six institutions, we've got to begin to think about the, the concept of who has authority in each one, right? And, and I think this will make sense in just a minute. These are all independent places of authority, and they have rules that apply to, to one that may not apply to the other. Each has its own boundaries, and when these boundaries get crossed or get blurred, that's when we have problems. So in other words, um, if each institution of authority or each sphere, each realm of authority it doesn't, it doesn't naturally cross over into the other one. In other words, when I was, when I was 23 years old, I became a cop. And I always kind of think, is like, man, I, when I look back, like, man, I was way too young to have that kind of authority. But I had authority to, to enforce the law. And so I could pull someone over, I could arrest somebody for something, and I had that authority, but I could not go into their home and tell them how to live their lives. So just because I had authority in one area of my life, didn't mean that I have an authority over other areas. And so we've, if the central issue is authority, what we're trying to understand is who has authority in which place, in, in, different, in different places, like in other places, you know, when you go to work, your boss has authority there to tell you what to do. But your boss can't show up at your house and tell you what to do, right? He can't tell you how to, how to live your life. And so we understand that about these different places, but we don't always understand it good about in the church. Like, I feel like when it comes to church, there's, there's a blurring. It's a little confusing of, of who has authority, who, who can have authority there. Um, the most important sphere or realm or institution of authority is free will. Free will is the authority that you have over your own life. And I promise I'm getting somewhere with this. Free will is the authority that you have over your own, over your own life. You have the authority to make your own decisions. And when this is encroached upon in any sphere, then we have trouble. In other words, like in a a church, uh, a pastor has authority to to preach the word. The pastor has authority to to lead the church, but he doesn't have the authority to tell people how to live their lives. I mean, he can encourage them how to, but he can't really show them like, you have to do this or you have to do this. What happens when when, when that does happen, we have a cult, right? We have someone who is, who is imposing their will on someone else's and removing that person's free will. And so now, the most important place of authority in our lives is our own free will to make choices. And one of the reasons this is so important is, is people are so confused about the headship in the home. You know, I, I hear people say things all the time that, you know, I, we're going to read scriptures of men that say wives submit to your husbands, but they think that means sometimes that a husband, this is this distorted lens, guys, of how we, we not, may not view women as property, but we have this distorted lens many times that, that says that, that because maybe a husband has authority in his home, that that means he can tell his wife what to do or she has to follow no matter what. But that is, not, that is not partnership. That is not working together. That is encroaching on someone's free will. A husband leads his family with loving leadership, not with dominion and rule. And we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, it's going back to these spheres of authority in our lives. We've got free will. We've got this self-authority. We have marriage. We have the family. We have the workplace. We have government. And we have the church. Now, in the church, this becomes a, a little tricky because we try to take authority from many times from one sphere and, and bring it over into another one, or one institution and bring it over into another one. In other words, what has happened with Scripture is people have taken the authority that a husband has over his wife, his loving leadership, and we have taken that and applied that to verses uh, that, 
and apply that to the church. Yeah, it makes no sense that all women aren't under the authority of all men. The Bible doesn't teach that, and no one really believes that, that, that I could walk up to anybody's wife and tell her what to do. Right? No one really believes that. But we almost do the same thing with the church. We, we misinterpret Scripture and, and say that because the husband is the head of his wife, that there's no way once we get into a different sphere or a different institution that the wife could also have a place of authority. So in other words, if, if a husband has authority over his wife at home, but maybe she's the mayor of the city, does that mean that, that he has authority over her as the mayor? In that realm of government? No, no one actually believes that, right? Or if, you're, if your wife's a doctor, could you walk into the hospital and say, hey, this is what you have to do? If, if she was maybe a general manager of a business and had an owner above her, the husband could never walk into this place and say, this is how you need to run your business. That would make no sense. No one would do that. Well, we've taken the authority that God has given husbands over their families, and we've taken that and transposed it into the church. And we've said now husbands or men will always be the ones who have authority in the church. And guys, I know you're, you're probably thinking of some verses, but we're going to tackle those. That is not what Scripture teaches. So let's go to Genesis 2 now, because I know when I read Genesis 1, you're probably thinking, yeah, he didn't really read Genesis 2, because it says a little more. It differentiates the sexes a little more. Well, let's, let's read Genesis 2. Genesis 2, verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground... Excuse me, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. Out of the ground the Lord God calls to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So notice here first, God did make man first. That's very clear in Scripture. God made man first, and he gave him a job. Now let's go down to verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And this word helper, guys, it's, it's so many times, it's a word used to describe God and how he helps us. So I will make a, a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to all the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and then he took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh at that place, and then the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one, one flesh. And the man and his wife are both naked, and we're not ashamed. So Genesis 1 doesn't really give us any differences between men and women, but Genesis 2 does, right? Man was created first. He was given a job. There wasn't a helper suitable for him. So God, secondly, doesn't mean that she was not as good or that she was, or he had to make man better, and so he made a woman, neither one. He made a woman, and he gave the woman to the man, and the man called her a woman, and they became one. So we're still in the beginning. So I'm reading this because, again, if you are to hear an argument that, that men are superior or that women cannot lead, preach, teach in the church, they can't lead in, in, the, in the body of Christ, these portions of Scripture are the foundations uh, or the foundational teachings that people use. Well, at the very most, at the very most, all you can pull from this is a hint that man might have some type of authority. And the only reason you can pull that at all, if you're really just looking at it, is because God created him first. God gave him a job, and then God made woman. So I hope this makes sense, right? So it, what I'm saying is, at the very most, you can just get a hint that, get, that, that man might have a place of authority over a woman. Well, actually, let me rephrase that. Not that man would have, a, have authority over a woman, but that a husband would have authority over wife, because this was talking about marriage, right? The, the two became one flesh. They, left, they leave their father and mother. The two become one. It's talking about in a marriage. So at the most, we have a hint. So when people say foundation, man, God made man first. This means that, that he has authority. That's just not there. It's just not there. And this is the foundational uh, piece that, that people use to promote this. 
So in the light of Genesis 1, they're equal. But in the light of Genesis 2, Adam was made first, received instructions from God, and Eve was made second. And again, at the most, I kind of keep saying this, at the most we have a hint that there's some type maybe of authority over Eve in marriage. In marriage, that's the only thing it talks about here. Not in the world, but in marriage. So not in business, not in government, and absolutely not in church. It doesn't say anything about the, the spiritual body of God, there being any authority here. So what's hinted at in Genesis 2, here's the deal, though. What's hinted at in Genesis 2 is confirmed in the New Testament. So let me say it this way. What's hinted at in Genesis 2 that, that a husband may have some type of authority over his wife, is actually confirmed in the New Testament. So let's read some of these verses. 1 Peter 3.1. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands. It doesn't say women be submissive to men in church. It doesn't say women be submissive to men out, you know, in, in, just in, in all areas of life. You know, when, during the New Testament, women were submissive to men period. Like they, they were viewed as property, and women had to come under men, not just their husbands. But this is what, what the New Testament teaches is, in the same way, wives, be submissive to your own husbands. Not someone else's husband. Be submissive to your own husbands. It doesn't say anything about the church, the body of Christ, yet this is used to, to, to promote this. Colossians 3.18, wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Ephesians 5.22, wives, be subject to your own husbands, not to someone else's husband, as to the Lord. The language of these verses is not saying that women must submit to men. It's simply saying that wives should submit to their husbands. And again, I want to keep saying this. If you're sitting there looking and you're like, yeah, my wife needs to submit to me. What this is absolutely talking about is, well, I don't know why we view authority in the context of marriage as someone telling someone else what to do. Because you may view the pastor, me, as an authority uh, in the church, but you wouldn't stand for me telling you what to do. It's not about um, overreaching into someone's self-will and that place of authority in their lives. Like, they have authority of their own lives. It is a loving leadership, not a rule and dominion. Husbands do not rule and dominate their wives. They lovingly lead them. And there's a, there's a big difference. You know, every time someone says, you know, my, or some guy says, like, man, my wife's not obeying me, she doesn't have to obey you. That's, it's not what it teaches. It, it is not, a marriage is not me telling you what to do. That's not marriage. A marriage is oneness, working together, one loving leading, and one submitting to that loving leadership. The hint in Genesis 2 that a husband may have authority over his wife is absolutely confirmed in the New Testament. But there's confusion when it comes to some other verses in Scripture about this topic. One of the reasons for this confusion is this, is that in the Greek, the word for man is the same word for husband. And the word for woman is the same word for wife. So think about that for a minute. The New Testament was written in the Greek. The same word that's used for man is used for husband. The same word that's used for woman is used for wife. So it is up to the interpreters to determine what context what is being said is, is talking about. So in other words, if it's talking about the confines of a marriage, then it should say husband and wife. If it's talking about something just general that has nothing to do with marriage, we could say man and a woman. But when, the, inter when the, the people who translated the Bible, when they get it wrong, it causes confusion. So let's look at a few of these places. So 1 Corinthians 11.3 actually says this, and I'll read the New American Standard mainly. And it says that man is the head of a woman. But this is actually a parallel verse to, to the Ephesians verse we read. And it should be translated, not that man is the head of a woman. And this, this is used to promote the idea of male headship in the church. But that's not, what, that's not the context what it's talking about. It actually should be, should be translated that a husband is the head of his wife. And guys, I hope you're seeing the big difference here. You know, actually, there's a few translations that did get it right that I can share with you. The Amplified says, Christ is the head of every man, and the head of a woman is her husband. The, the English Standard Version says, the head of every man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband. So you get that? The head of a man is Christ, and the head of a wife is her husband. Not, it doesn't say that every spiritual leader or the pastor in a church. The head of a wife is, 
is her husband. Young's literal translation says, the head of a woman is her husband. So this verse that says man is the head of a woman, it's just not translated correctly. It's talking about marriage. So men and women were created differently. And I believe that because of a man's wiring, in some situations, he may be better suited for certain things. But here's also what I noticed. It's not, it's not as dependent upon if you're male or female as it is on the person. Guys, there are some women that are much better leaders than some men. And I don't know that really anybody out there is going to disagree with me on that. There, there, there are some women that are much better leaders than some men, right? And, and vice versa. Many that say that women cannot preach, teach, or lead in the church ultimately base their argument on Genesis 2, that man was created first and therefore he's the head. It doesn't say that except for in the, the hint at within marriage. So let's keep going through this. We're going to get to Genesis 3. Unfortunately, um, there was the fall of man, right? Sin came in. So it, can we all agree that the Garden of Eden was perfection, right? And, and, and what we see in Genesis 1 and 2 is that there were, there were men and women were both created equally and we don't see one having dominion or rule over another, even though I think there is headship hinted at there. But unfortunately, in many societies, male domination has crept in, including the church. So 2,000 years ago, New Testament, Jewish people, male domination had crept into that culture and that society, and it was wrong. Probably everybody listening to me would agree that, that women should not be treated as property. Probably everyone, everyone agrees on that, but yet that is what they believed. That's why they said what they said about divorce, right? Like, man, this isn't good because we, we want to be able to do whatever we want to when it comes to our wives. So if, if there's a bad lens that these guys 2,000 years ago in this Jewish culture were looking at, could it be that we also have a lens because of the fall that maybe isn't completely correct? So the, the perfection in the beginning was this two become one. There was an equality there. There was a there was the both of them made in the image of God. There's not a lot of emphasis on, on domination or rule or authority except for over the earth, but not ever <coughs> over one another. So we have the fall of man. Uh, Eve ate the forbidden apple, gave it to Adam. They ate it, obviously. And then we get to Genesis 3, verse 15, and we get what we call uh, the curse, right? So there was perfection in the garden, and now there becomes a curse, uh, on, on, male, on men and women. So I, I hope you're seeing this. In the beginning, there's some equality there. One isn't dominating or ruling the other. But then a part of the fall, part of the curse, is actually what we're experiencing today. So Genesis 3.15, and it says this. God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. <coughs> Excuse me. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, and in pain you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and yet he will rule over you. This, we know clearly this is part of the curse. This is part of what happens when a culture falls into sin. And God actually says what it looked like. He says, your desire to a woman will be for your husband. Now, some falsely interpret this to be talking about sex. Well, we all know that's not true, right? Like women like to say in women, your desire will be to have sex with your husband. It's the, it's the other way around. We probably wish that was true. But that's not what it says there. When he says your desire will be for your husband, he's talking about you are going to have a desire to manipulate, to dominate, to rule him. But it says he will rule over you. That the, the male gender became the stronger of the two sexes, and even though the wife desired, there's something in there because of the fall, because of sin, to rule over him, this is part of the fall, yet what will happen is he will dominate and he will rule over you. Think about that. This is part of the curse. The battle of, of the sexes. One trying to rule the other. And it's what we've been experiencing ever since. We've experienced it both sides. Women trying to rule their husbands, yet husbands ruling their wives. Can you just fathom that? Rent? This is part of the curse. What God is saying, hey, because you didn't listen, because you didn't obey, you're going to experience trouble in the world. And part of the big picture that he paints is, is the battle 
of, of ruling and dominating between the sexes. And guys, when we begin to talk about, I believe this with all my heart, when we talk about can women lead, pre, lead preach, teach in the church, we are, we are actually talking about this. We are dealing with still the repercussions of the fall. But guys, Jesus came to break the curse. He came to say, let's get things back to how I meant them to be. Let's get things back to how they should be. What he, I believe he is saying is like, man, what I want you to do is to become one. To become, to become one. To work together, to walk together. To not rule or dominate each other. But for the husband to lovingly lead his wife and for the wife to lovingly follow her husband. But... It's always, you know, in here it is talking about marriage. It's not talking, we, we haven't read anything that's talking about another sphere, another institution. That we, you know, we talked about these institutions of authority. We haven't read anything else that talks yet about another institution. So a result of the fall is the corruption of the relationship between men and women, between husbands and wives, and then into all areas of society. This corruption, and it, it, it really turned into a corruption of male authority in marriage, in culture, and in the church. I said it. It, it turned into a corruption of male authority in the church where, where men are, are given the, what's the word I want? Uh, they're, they're given the platform to rule and have authority and women are not. And I want to say to you, that is not the heart of God. I know you got some verses in your mind. We are going to tackle all the hard verses. God is, is here, in a sense, prophesying. He's giving a prediction that male authority will overreach its intended boundaries and treat women as a lesser. So I hear people say, like, you know, yeah, I don't believe that women can teach, lead, or preach in the church, but I don't think they're a lesser than. Guys, I don't see how you can say that. If, if all you're saying is, well, I just think there's some verses that say they can't, you have to believe that in some reason they're not up to the challenge. Because God just doesn't do things for any reason. You say, well, God has an order. Yeah, he absolutely has an order. So we're going to talk about his order, but, but don't take the order of the marriage and transpose it into the church. Male domination is a result of the fall, affecting marriage and other areas of life, often causing women to be seen as inferior to men. But in Christ and in the church, it should not be this way. One aspect of this male domination that came through the fall is that, 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 that men are, are, are overreaching in, in all spheres or all institutions of authority. There is a headship in marriage. The husband is the head of the wife. But the male gender is not the head of the female gender. If God has called a woman to preach, to teach, or to lead in a certain area, who... Are we to impose our will upon their self-will? So I said to you earlier, the most important place of authority is self-will. Is the authority you have over your own life. No one can make you or should control you or manipulate to do what they want. So no matter how you put it, if a woman feels called to lead, teach, or preach, and we say she cannot, we are encroaching on her self-will. It's a really important subject, as I said already, because there are a lot of godly, amazing women in the church. And we should be helping to equip and hold them up and lift them up and to do the things that God's called them to do, not standing on a bad interpretation of Scripture. To extend the authority or headship that God gave man in marriage to all relationships and all situations and all institutions involving men and women is a clear abuse of delegated authority taken out of its boundaries. So you're probably wondering, like, hey, when's he going to get to these other verses? We're going to get into those in the next couple of weeks. But we had to stop, start here because I, I want you to be to, to think about, I want the wheels to be turning about this idea of, you know, what we see in Scripture when it comes to, the, to the, the, the headship of the husband over the wife, this is really the foundational thing I want you to see. When it comes to that, are we possibly taking that and applying it to places of authority other than the marriage? Again, none of you would say, 
You know, if you would say this, you know, if you would say, yeah, I agree that a husband is the head of the wife, none of you would say that if she has a job and she's the head of that job that you could go in and tell her what to do there. I don't th- maybe some of you would say that, but I don't think most of you would say that. And we wouldn't, no matter, all those other institutions, government, the workplace, whatever, you know, we would not say that. But for some reason, well, bad interpretation of Scripture, we say it in the church. We say that a husband has authority over his wife in the home, and men have authority over women in the church. And guys, we're, we're going to get into some of these verses and really look at what they're talking about. We're going to look into next week. We're going to talk about more key passages in the New Testament you may be thinking about. But I want to challenge you to, uh, to pray, to seek the Lord. And man, I, I want to see all of us more free when it comes to the curse of... of <laughs> that God predicted what happened to, to the male and female genders, this battle that happens, and that we would get more freedom in, in our marriages. We get more freedom in the church. We get more freedom in relationships. And that we would not only agree that women are not inferior to men, but we would allow them to hold a place in a position that proves that we believe that. Because for me, it's one thing to say, yeah, I think women can do all these things. I just don't think in the church they can have the position to do it. Well, for me, I just really struggle with that because God's not into titles. And so basically what we're saying is she can't have a title, but she can do all these things. Um, we would even say she can do them as long as her husband says it's okay. But remember, these are different institutions. One is the church, one's the home, one's self-will, one's government, one's workplace, one's a family. And no doubt we should be working together, but yeah, we're going to paint some good pictures of what it could and what it should look like. And we're probably also going to paint some pictures of some of the bad uh, that we've seen in this. And so I want you guys to be blessed, but I really want to see us stand on what, what I believe is truth. And I want to see us get better and better at freeing men to free women <laughs> and freeing women to be all that God's called them to be. So I hope you guys are are blessed today, and I know this is, you know, kind of a, a, a it's a different message to kind of end on, you know, or, or to, to, to form an ending today. Um, but I want you to begin to think about this. I want you to, I want the wheels to be turned. I want you to look at Scripture. I want you to, to you can't ask me questions on, the, on these video things, but you can call me. We can talk about it. Uh, you can email me. Um, I want us to dig in this together and find the truth. So I'm going to pray for you guys, and I want you to be blessed. I want to see you uh, this afternoon between 1 and 2. When we pray for you guys, we'll, we'll, we'll let you go. Uh, yeah, we love you guys so much. Lord Jesus, I thank you for every man and every woman that's watching today. And God, I just pray freedom over us. God, the truth sets us free. So God, I don't want to portray or, or declare a false truth. God, I want it to be your word, your truth. And God, I, I pray that, that we would see women free to be who you've called them to be. God, and I, say, I pray that we would see men free to be who not only you've called them to be, but men free be free to, to allow women to be free, God, that we wouldn't feel the bondage to hold women back from any position in the body of Christ. God, we bless you. We love you. We thank you for your word. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys. Hope to see you in just a few hours today. Bless you. The darkest night, you can light it up. You can light it up